Say there, stranger, remember me? I'm that stranger who stalks your sanity. So how about it? Are you ingenuous? Would you call yourself ingenuous? Or have you used that word recently? It's not a word one hears commonly. There is, however, another word one hears a lot if your ears are open and your mind is alert. Disingenuous. Disingenuous could be the label of the time we live in. You see disingenuousness everywhere. Everywhere on the media, all the talking heads, all the politicians, the so-called leaders, all the social influencers are all disingenuous. And some of them are criminally disingenuous. What does disingenuous mean? Yeah, that means to be falsely sincere. It's a soft way of saying to be a liar and a fake and to say one thing and mean another. I think you might agree that we live in an era that is plagued with disingenuous voices and disingenuous people in all walks of life, in all areas of life, and especially at the level of politics, which is just a soft word for crime. So, let's say it's an unavoidable circumstance. You live in a world today where there's a lot of disingenuous expressions coming to you from all directions. But where are the ingenuous expressions? Where are the ingenuous human animals? And if you are ingenuous, on what terms, by what standards do you consider yourself to be so? It's easy to say that the word almost equates, or may exactly equate, with innocence. So to be ingenuous is to be innocent. Are you innocent? Am I innocent? Can you see those who are not innocent? Politicians, heads of state, heads of great corporations, banks, all the big time players, they're not innocent. And it's becoming more and more clear even to, let's say, those of mediocre intelligence who don't tend to question things very much and haven't educated themselves in the discipline of critical thinking. And so there you go. That's the situation in what I call the world drama today. So let's you and I take a look at it. And let's start by looking at ourselves. Are you ingenuous? And if you are, so what? Now I propose to you that there are two approaches to this word. Let's be sure what we're talking about. I'll break it down grammatically into three terms. Ingenuousness, that's the noun. Ingenuous, that's the adverb. But what is the verb? Is there a verb for the action of being ingenuous? I don't think so. I suppose you could say to be sincere, but sincere is a cheap word. And there's something about the word ingenuous that's not cheap. There's something about it to my ears and perhaps to yours as well that's rare, special, and deserves special consideration. So I would advise, since I'm here giving personal advice on the internet after all these years, 
I would advise approaching the term ingenuous in two ways. First of all, let's, you and I, equate it with innocence. So the question is, are you innocent? And if so, so what? Innocence can be considered in a legal framework, guilty or innocent. So let's say that I consider myself to be innocent. By what standard? Well, by the legal standard, it means that I'm not guilty of any crime. But let's look at it more generally. Let's go back to the so-called first principle of natural law, so-called natural law. There is no natural law. It's a, an, it's a proposition of human invention. But I believe that it can be stated in this way. The first principle of natural law is that you do not harm, cheat, or steal from others, and that you do not lie to others, and you do not harm or physically hurt anyone else without cause. And there is cause on occasion to do harm, physical harm, to others. So that would be the standard in terms of so-called natural law. How do I hold myself against that standard? Well, I have to say that I seem to hold up against that standard. And when I go back and look over my life, and I've done this from time to time, and ask myself, have I ever cheated or stolen from someone else? Or have I committed harm to someone else, either physical, verbal, or emotional harm, without good reason to do so? And I have to say, maybe you won't believe me, but I don't think I have. When I ask myself the question about theft, have I ever stolen anything from anyone? The first thing that comes to my mind is an incident when I was living in Belgium and I had no money and no place to live and it so happens through my connections in the Belgian nobility that I was invited to stay in the room of a beautiful house in a Beverly Hills like suburb of Brussels called Biege or Rixensa and that was in the house of a countess of the Belgian nobility named Vincien Le Hardy de Beaulieu. And when I left there, I stole a towel from her. It was a towel from Cozumel in Mexico. She had gone there on vacation, and it was a big beach towel with a parrot on it. If I ask myself, scanning back, looking in the rearview mirror, have I ever stolen anything? And that's the first thing that comes to mind. When I ponder it, nothing else really comes to mind. So, I'm innocent, except for that case. I'm guilty of stealing a towel, a beach towel, from one of the members of the Belgian nobility. Guilty as charged. So when I go back and look at my record, well, by that standard, if that's what innocence is, then I'd have to say, yeah, I'm, I appear to be quite innocent. I haven't deceived anyone in my life intentionally, although I've deceived myself, and by implication or through repercussions, I may have deceived and misled other people. I've certainly misled people in my life about myself and my intentions. But I didn't do it intentionally. I did it because I was not being honest with myself. There's another word, honest. To be ingenuous, does that mean to be honest? Are you honest? And if you are, so what? Now there's a second way to approach this word, ingenuous. Not on a standard of guilt or innocence, 
but on a standard of direct perception, as if you are perceiving an attribute. So what comes to my mind in that approach is the innocence of children, the ingenuous beauty of children. It's arguable, I think you would agree, it's not even arguable that you can see that in children. Maybe not everyone does. Maybe there are those predecites of a particular uh, bias who uh, see that ingenuousness in children as something that they desire, that they don't have, they envy it, and therefore they want to destroy it because envy is the emotion that compels people to destroy what they cannot have or cannot be, whereas jealousy simply means that you would like to be something else, you would like to have something else, but you don't have the intention to harm or destroy those who are that way or who have those things. Important distinction between envy and jealousy. So do those who presumably, if you listen to the rumors, prey in the most hideous manner upon children, have envy toward the ingenuous quality of children? I would say yes. And I would say that this is a, an imperative and profoundly troubling issue of our time, which needs to be solved not just on moral grounds, but on the grounds of survival. No species can survive if there are members of the species among them who would prey on the innocence and ingenuousness of children, of, of the young. So it's a huge survival issue. There, there, cannot, there cannot be tolerance for even one case of that kind of predation. So if you and I agree that ingenuousness is quality that can be directly perceived, where do you perceive it? Where do I perceive it? Well, I perceive it in children, of course. I think that's the most general and universal case but I perceive it also in strong measure, which deeply moves me, moves in animals, in the ingenuous quality of a donkey, big-eared little donkey, the ingenuous beauty of a seal, of a mother whale. Name them, you can name them by the thousands. The ingenuous beauty of a butterfly. Do you have that beauty in you? And this quality of beauty is an attribute that has, in fact, without perhaps being directly named, it has been the central topic of a long debate about human goodness. There is a way in which you can practically equate the presumption of human goodness with the perception of this rare and beautiful quality. Isn't that clear? Throughout my whole life and continuing today, I constantly look for and see the ingenuous quality of non-human life. You can say that a, a flower is ingenuous, a daisy is ingenuous, a grub worm is ingenuous, as long as it's not in your salad, and even if it is, just pick it out. And there's no question in my mind that that direct perception is relative. I'm fully aware that there are massive, that there is massive evidence of an untold number of human animals in certain cultures who do not perceive the ingenuous quality of animals such as dogs and cats. They don't. 
They just don't. And they do not respect the lives of non-human creatures due to lacking that perception. So let's just say for the sake of this monologue that the perception, appreciation, and respect for inherent ingenuousness is not absolute, it's relative. But then that begs the question, is the presence of that quality relative? Does it exist in everyone? And asking that question is tantamount to asking, is human nature essentially good? So just as I said a moment ago, this has been a subject of great debate. So I'll ask you, as I've asked myself, are you essentially and innately good? Do you sense and see goodness in yourself as a fundamental and primary quality of your sense of being human? And even if you may not have always acted in what you yourself or others judge in a good way, that does not preclude possibility that you have and hold that essential goodness in yourself. Now to me, this is where the exploration begins to get really interesting and deep. How so? Well, I'm going to state a proposition which I would consider to be one of the fundamental top ten talking points of the Great Recovery. And it goes like this. Does someone who is truly and innately a good person need to be perceived as a good person? Now again, when I bring it around to myself, and I've thought about this more than you can possibly imagine, and I've talked about it a lot, both professionally and with friends, I can't detect in myself that I've ever had the need to be perceived as a good person or perceived as ingenuous. However, I must add a qualification to that. Now, what I'm going to say right now goes into the area of what it was called in the recovery movement inappropriate disclosure. And I think they call it these days TMI, too much information. Nevertheless, I must make this disclosure due to the fact that I am not neurotypical and that clinically I belong to what is called the ADS and I'm at the violet end of the spectrum. It goes from violet to red. Due to the fact that I have this condition and I've had it since birth and it's not induced autism, it's genuine natural born autism, I have largely tended to disregard through my life how other people see me. This is absolutely inherent to the condition and it may disqualify me from what we're discussing. I have to admit it openly. It's an inappropriate disclosure, but I have to make it in order to be honest and on the level with you in what I'm saying here now. Maybe I'm a freak because I just don't fucking care and I never have. However, maybe I'm not a freak. Let's say I'm not a freak. And let's say that my NA autistic disinterest in others seeing me and how they see me, whether they like or dislike me, whether they approve or disapprove of me, maybe, hold on, maybe that anomaly is not an anomaly at all. Suppose that that factor in the artistic character is actually an inherent factor of human nature 
that is rare and precious. And so you also could be quasi-autistic to the extent that you don't care about whether you are seen to be a good person or not. Now I'm playing with a delicate and in my mind really powerful proposition here. So I want to make it clear to you before I conclude this talk. I consider that being a good person, being truly ingenuous, excludes the need to be seen as such. Now you may say, okay, John, you're just talking out of your bias. You're talking out of your non-neurotypical constitution. And that may be so, but suppose it isn't so. What if it isn't so? What if what I'm actually talking about is the core of humanity, the core of human nature, do you live from the core of human nature? How do you need to be seen by others? And how much of what you do is affected and influenced by the need to be seen? Now, I'm going to close this talk and pick up this theme of ingenuousness in the next talk, and probably I'll continue it through this series. But in closing, I want to say something that comes from my other work. You know, I said at the beginning of the Great Recovery series that I wasn't going to refer to planetary tantra or the term of guy awakening or not in his image, and the recovery of the narrative and method of the mysteries. I wasn't going to talk about all the other work that I've done, and I don't need to. But in this one instance, I'll make an exception. There's a saying that goes around a lot among people I know personally and among my entourage of students around the world. And it goes like this. The root of all addiction is addiction to the pain of not being seen. Now this is a meme, and it's a strong one. It's strong, strong medicine. The addiction to the pain of not being seen is the core of narcissism. In every single case, whatever it may be, every man, woman, and child of any age, of any race, the core of the illness of narcissism is addiction to the pain of not being seen. And so, if that's true, can you and I infer from that that the primordial innocence of human nature that defines us as a species needs to be seen? Well, that sort of contradicts what I said before, or maybe it doesn't. Does the innocence and ingenuousness in you, if you find it there, does it need to be seen? Or can you live without anyone ever seeing it? By the way, animals will see it. That's why they're so consoling and they're great healers. Your dog will see it and show you. Your cat will see it and pretend it doesn't. The donkey will see it. The hummingbird will see it. All of those non-human animals see it in us. But the fundamental question I'm putting out here, which feels to me like it's going to be an abiding theme in the great recovery is do you need to be seen in your innocence and in your ingenuous beauty 
as an adult child. And if you don't, fine. If you do, what do you do about it? This is where I have to ask you. Because <laughs> like I said, it hasn't really been much of a concern for me, but I'm a freak. And I perhaps might be not qualified to judge this issue. This is such an important issue. So I want to leave you with this thought, with this issue to think about. When you look at the world today of the media and you see that we live in a, an unprecedented time when everybody has the opportunity to be on the media all the time by filming themselves and uploading the film to TikTok, to Facebook, to whatever social media, what are they doing? Why do they do that? Well, obviously, one can presume they do it because they need to be seen. But why do they need to be seen? Why do they need to show the world that they are a good person, or a happy person, or a caring person? Or on the other hand, and this is the case with many of the uploads, especially on those toxic TikTok videos, why do they need to show themselves to the world as an outraged and righteous person who is standing up for some cause which may be as phony as they are and probably is? The opposite of being ingenuous is to be fake. So I'll leave you with that thought and I'll pick it up in the next episode of The Great Recovery. And until then, of course, I'll be seeing you in the beauty that kills. <laughs>